guys. Thank you very much. Let's get started. So, my name is Jim Blackhurst. I'm a solutions architect at MongoDB. And um, I am absolutely thrilled to be here today. I think it's amazing just to be back in front of people and seeing people in 3D again. Um, I guess by 3 o'clock today, you're probably sick of jokes like that about you know, being on Zoom and rest of it. So we'll cut to the chase. I've only got half an hour, and I've got quite a lot to get through. So I think one of the things that is interesting, though, is that during the time that we've all been away with COVID, it's kind of heightened a lot of perception about you know, how companies like you know, the organizations that you guys work for need to be building really strong applications and stuff that is really resonating with customers. Because you know, what COVID has taught us is that we need to be able to interact with services as customers really profoundly, really well over digital mechanisms. So I wanted to kind of just spend the first section here just kind of level setting on what we've seen in the last two years and the kind of things that we've been talking to customers about and the, the kind of challenges. So, the one thing that's become really, really top of mind and really important is that when you look at competitive advantages these days, it is absolutely fundamentally tied to your ability as an organization to leverage that most important asset you have, which is your data. We also see that you know, where there used to be barriers to entry, there just aren't anymore. Right? If you're in banking, for instance, you, know, you used to know who your competitors were. They were across the high street from you. But that, nowadays, they could be you know, people in Lithuania with a banking license that's got a mobile app that's absolutely killing you. Right? There's no barriers to entry in terms of customers taking your market share. Competitive advantage right, is fundamental to how you operate in this space. And everyone is using tools like you know, Tableau or, or Salesforce. They're awesome tools. But they're the same as what your competitors are using. So you're not going to get competitive advantage just by using the best quality tools off the shelf. And this isn't a race to the finish line, right? This isn't about getting to you know, the next goal and then we've made it. That's it. This is about sustainable innovation. This is about how we can unlock that agility amongst our developers so that we can continue to innovate and bring new services to market and delight our customers. And possibly the most important of this is that we have to now be the stewards of our customers' data. Right? This is super, super important. This is a trust relationship that we have with our customers. And when they ask us to look after their data, they expect certain standards from that. Delivering on these promises, delivering on new applications, new services that you're going to release into the market is fundamentally reliant on the quality of your underlying data infrastructure. And that's kind of the essence of what I wanted to talk about today. But I wanted to kind of step back a little bit and talk about some of the expectations that customers have around here. So when, you know, in the last sort of two years, when people have been interacting with services remotely, when they've been doing their banking through banking apps, when they've been ordering groceries online, They've learned what a good service or application looks like. And these are kind of defined in these, these criteria. People expect applications these days to be super, super responsive. There is zero tolerance for spinning wheels or laggy interfaces. They expect data to be there when they need it. They expect their interaction with those applications to expose relevant information, not stuff that we as as, as the organizations, as the developers think they might be interested in, but stuff that they genuinely need to see, stuff they care about. Mobile first, I mean, seriously, does anyone do their banking through a website anymore? I always use mobile app now, it's just so convenient. And there are territories in the world like, you know, I'm thinking here, like Malaysia and Indonesia, where there just isn't a market for desktops and, and laptops anymore. It's mobile first. If you don't have the ability to deploy your applications on mobile as effectively as you can on any other platform, you're not going to be competing. And as we said before, data privacy, right? This trust relationship, being able to hold securely and give confidence to your customers that you are going to be a steward of their data. Analytics, next best actions, personalization, 
When you interact with services, you expect them to understand who you are and what you're interested in. And then finally, always improving. And this is, this is another crucial point. You know, when I install an application on my phone, I might forgive you know, a few bugs in the interface or things, but I expect these things to get better over time. Right? I expect that you know, anything that I subscribe to is going to iterate and it's going to get better. And these are challenges. And the sad news, and if you, know, you look at some of the reports and some of the research, people who go on these journeys, you know, organizations that go on these enterprise modernization journeys, this is hard work, right? And it's fraught with all sorts of different difficulties. 70% of enterprises will fail somewhere along this journey. Good question. Fundamentally, working with data has always been the hardest part of building applications. Data is disparate in many sources, it's in many different structures, and as a developer, pulling all that together to build this application that is going to differentiate my company in the competitive market, that's the tough bit. And I think what's even more important is that the way that we've used data has changed. If you think about you know, the evolution that we've been on as developers in the last 15 to 20 years with the rise of things like object-oriented programming and then the move to, you know, away from monolithic architectures towards microservices. You know, this is a fast-paced change that we've seen, this evolution of de application development. But the infrastructure that powers the data is essentially the same today as it was in the 1970s when the patterns for relational technologies were first put down. And it's the relational databases that are causing these issues. And that's kind of what we wanted to talk about. When you're building applications against relational databases, there are a bunch of different things you have to consider. First of all, the rigidity of the schema makes iteration and agile development very, very difficult. Right? If you want to update your application, you know, your, your quality development team might come in the morning with a great idea and have it ready for deployment in the afternoon. But if it takes two weeks for your DBA team to issue an alter table command on your database, then that's a loss of productivity, right? And also, when you think about how developers use data in their code, right, they're thinking about data as objects. They're thinking about your customer as an object. They're thinking about a you know, piece of inventory in your warehouse as an object. They're thinking about your sales ledger as an object. But that's at odds with how you're storing the data in a relational system with rows and tables. And these systems, the relational systems, typically were never built with you know, high availability and you know, horizontal scale in mind. You know, relational systems came from a time when we only used them during office hours and you could take them down at the weekend for servicing right, or maintenance. Right? They don't need to be available. So any kind of move towards high availability is essentially going to have to be an add-on. And as a solutions architect, I get to see lots of customers. And what I used to think of this as being a, you know, kind of, wow, this is crazy stuff. No, this is, this is just real life for a lot of people. A lot of people just live this. Right? And you know you've got a problem when you can't find a printer big enough to print all this out in one go and stick it on your office wall. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, Jeff Needham. So Jeff works for an American company, you'll be forgiven if you haven't heard them, Travelers. They're a business insurance, they're an insurance company, one of the largest insurers in the US, uh, about $30 billion in revenue, about 30,000 employees. Jeff, uh, Senior Director of Architecture, specifically in the um, business insurance um, business unit. Jeff knew from what he was seeing around his industry, that there were competitors in his market that were eating his lunch. And he was having difficulty keeping up. He knew what he had to do. Jeff's a smart guy. He's been to conferences like this. He's learned all the things. He knows that they need to revolutionize how they're building applications. They need to implement agile methodologies. 
and they need to break apart those monoliths, just like we've all been taught into microservices. He even went as far as to build a continuous delivery pipeline so that the developers, when they built code, could then get it out as fast as possible. It had no impact on the bottom line. In the end, regardless of how fast the developers were able to develop code, their legacy relational databases were still holding them back. And Jeff summed it up nicely. You know, whenever they were pushing out changes, they still had to wait often days, if not weeks, for those changes to be pushed out in production by the DBAs. This is not efficiency. But one of the things that you know, people are talking about a lot at the moment is, is you know, how we can mitigate against this challenge of relational databases. And you see you know, lots of NoSQL technologies coming out that are you know, working to solve some of these problems. And what you see is that the, the NoSQL technologies that you can deploy for this can address very specific little kind of slices of this and make everything just that little bit better. You know, you can put in front of your relational systems a wide variety of capability to cope with those challenging use cases you have. You might have a cache in front of the relational database just to speed things up. You know, some of those queries might need to be remodeled into a wide column store. That's cool. We can do that. You know, we've all heard about graph and time series. Those are bound to be, you know, use cases within your organization somewhere, right? And then we'll have a key value store on the end just for the session data as well. You know, this is, this is normal stuff now. The challenge you see is that each one of these individual systems has a very limited query capability. Right. Often with NoSQL, it's all eventually consistent. You don't know, you can't be sure that the data you're reading is the same as your last write. And how am I going to get data in there? Right? I'm going to have to like, create some ETL process. That's another thing that I've got to build. That's another thing I've got to maintain. Right? And then maybe, maybe, maybe we're there. But individually, these things, right, they're all suitable for just that one slight, small little niche use case. And then you get a letter from the CEO saying, you know what our customers need, don't you? We don't want to give them these pages and pages of results that they've got to pass through each time. We want to give them a search engine. We want to give them search capability. That's a perfectly normal thing to ask for, right? So now we've got to put search engines in. So we need a search engine on the relational database. We've got to get data in there somehow. We need to have some kind of you know, uh, search engine on the session data as well, so people can see where they are. More ETL jobs. This is, OK, we can do this. This is fine. We're OK. But what we're looking at here is an erosion of the time that our developers and our development teams should be spending on building things that are differentiating us against our competitors when actually all they're doing is just you know, managing the existing data infrastructure. All right? That's people, time, and money being spent on just keeping the lights on. And the more you add in, the worse this gets. What about mobile? We didn't think about mobile, right? So now, because it's mobile, we have to do it twice, iOS and Android, right? Now, how are we going to get data in there? So I don't know. like. We need a message queue, right? Because that's the way that you've got to push it, because it's not always online, so you need to queue these things up. And you know, that's more stuff I've got to maintain. And then, you know, what about month end reporting and understanding the state of the business? That needs an analytics database as well. So we've got to take all the operational data, all the transactional data from the relational system. Right? More ETL jobs. This time we're going to use some like crazy CDC tool to get the streaming data out of the, you can see where this is going, right? There's more and more time being spent on managing these individual data infrastructure platforms than there is being spent actually building you know, viable applications. You know, this is not something unusual. We're seeing a lot of this, and I can put some labels on here, and we can see potentially what this might look like. This is just an example, right? There's millions of choices that you could go down for this. No right or wrong answers at all. But 
you know, each one of these systems works differently. There's no major commonality between them. They all have different security models. They all have different monitoring, right? They all need different mechanisms for ingestion or different mechanisms for querying, right? We're creating a headache. We're creating a fragmented development experience, right? We've got developers now who can't work on just one platform like they used to do with relational systems, right? They understood that, that was okay. Now they're working on the relational systems, but a whole wide variety, a whole gamut of different technologies that they're using as sticking plasters to make that platform stand out. Reduce predictability. Each one of those systems works in different ways. Right? You're not sure what the query performance of this, if you're hitting this system, is compared to that system. How can you ensure a consistent experience for your customers? How can you make sure that the governance model that your organization has demanded that you work in can be applied to all those different systems? Right? Do they all have equivalent security controls? How do you get data in there? How do you connect them to other stuff? Right, this is all things that your developers are going to have, not just implement, but maintain. And we haven't even talked about data duplication, right? With this many systems, and how are you going to keep it all in sync? Today, I'm going to call this DIRT. A data and innovation recurring tax. Now, I want to stress the recurring bit, here, right? Because this isn't a one-off thing. This isn't something that you do, and then you're off to the races. If you don't head this off straight on, right, this will be with you forever. I am fortunate enough to work with lots of different companies who are dealing with this. And there are challenges. This isn't easy. But there are people out there that are looking at how we can move forward into this more agile, unlocked future without having to spread our infrastructure all the way out. And as I can see it, there are four guiding principles that I've seen companies adopting. First one is absolute dynamical focus on developer productivity. That's what this is about. That's why we're going on this journey. It's because we want our developers, which are the most expensive resource that we have today in our organizations, to be unlocked to do the work that they need to do for us to be competitive. Second one, whatever we choose to deploy, and we all believe that this is going to be a polyglot solution in some sense, there has to be commonality, right? We can't have lots of disparate systems. We need to be repeatable, right? We need to make sure that whatever we choose, we can apply the same rules, the same governance, the same controls to every one of those systems. Security can no longer be something that we think of as an afterthought. It has to be baked into the platform. And I mean that by the security protocols. The governance that we're talking about needs to be available right from the beginning. And finally, the fourth one, have no compromise about your deployment strategy. All right? Allow your developers to pick and choose whichever cloud is right for your tools Right, for your services. And if you want, if you need to, go multi-cloud. Choose one cloud for your operational and then one cloud for your analytical, but spread that data through only one system. So I want to briefly talk about MongoDB and how MongoDB approaches these problems, what we can do to help. So you'll probably be familiar with MongoDB in terms of our database, our core database. Well, over the past two, maybe three years, we've invested a huge amount of time and energy in turning that core database into an entire ecosystem platform with a single focus, absolute single focus, on unlocking developer agility. We want you to be able to accelerate and simplify the time it takes to get new services from ideas into your customers' hands. At the core of what makes MongoDB so different is the document model. MongoDB stores data as JSON objects within the database. You don't need ORM layers. You don't need to map it in any way. The data that you use as developers that comes from APIs is exactly the same structure 
that you're storing in the database. And when you start thinking about the document model with all its richness and all the capability that you have for nested JSON objects, you suddenly start to realize that actually the document model is a superset of all the other models. So if you need to model stuff using relational uh, techniques, you need to split stuff across tables and then do joins, you can do that. That's fine. The document model allows you to do it. If you want to use the document model as a simple key value store, you can do it. You can model lots of different types of data just within a JSON document. And the benefit here is this entire thing is wrapped up in a single unified development experience. So your developers don't need to learn lots of different tools to do graph traversals or to do geospatial lookups or to do caching or anything like that. It's all through one unified interface. And that interface is exposed to you in whichever programming language that your developers choose to use. And there's a wide spectrum of services that we've started to deploy against this core capability. So we recently introduced Search, for instance. So MongoDB, MongoDB Atlas now includes uh, Lucene, Lucene 8, as a search engine. So you don't need to have a separate um, search engine sitting next to your database. You can just do that within. And the querying is exactly the same. The developers don't need to learn anything new. They don't. Your operations team don't have to have a separate way of securing this whole system. It's all part of MongoDB. Transactional workloads, right? So one of the things that people don't expect from MongoDB is the breadth of capability that we have, which we've inherited from relational systems. So multi-document acid transactions, for instance, strong consistency, secondary indexing, all the things that you expect to see in relational databases are available to you in MongoDB. You can take relational workloads and just drop them on MongoDB, and they'll work. You'd be missing the point of using MongoDB, but they would work. I've mentioned search. Mobile, about two years ago, we acquired a company called Realm. And you may know, you may not know, but most of you will have a Realm database in your pocket. Realm is, um, is one of the most popular um, on-device databases for mobile application developers today. When we spoke to the Realm team and we understood what they were doing, the ethos that they had for managing data was almost exactly a match for the way that we were doing it with MongoDB. Being able to bring Realm and MongoDB together has been one of the best things that we've done in terms of bringing data and data capability to the edge and unlocking some of that agility that, that application developers have. And you may know this about MongoDB already, but we've got a very strong in-database analytics capability through the aggregation pipeline. The ability to do very rich aggregations of data, very capable um, analysis and, and restructuring of data without having to move that out into a separate system. We've boosted that over the past 18 months, two years, with our own native visualization tools. So MongoDB Charts now, which is available and free for you to use, allows you to take the data in MongoDB, the native JSON data, create wonderful charts with it, which can then be embedded, because they're JavaScript, directly into your own web applications. And we've also recognized that there's many customers out there that have you know, probably petabytes of data locked away in, object, in cloud object stores. You know, this could be Avro, could be Parquet, or CSV, or any kind of format. And one of the things that our customers asked us was, you know, our developers love using MongoDB query language. They love the way that MongoDB works. Can you not somehow take that and put it on top of our data that we've got in, in object stores? And we have. We've detached the query engine. You can now query your own data lake, bring your own data, and you still get federated queries. So you fire a query at MongoDB. If it's in the operational store, you'll get your answer from there. If not, it will go and come from the, um, the cloud object store. And all of this wouldn't mean anything if we hadn't have built it on the strongest possible foundations. MongoDB is a distributed database. Right? It runs on a number of different nodes, typically on commodity hardware or cloud instances. It's not an appliance that you have to wheel into a data center. Right? 
This, this is very easy to set up and deploy. And with MongoDB Atlas, you can deploy it with a couple of clicks of a button or with Terraform or other API tools and automation. With field level encryption, client side field level encryption, we've set the bar for what it means to allow sensitive workloads to be moved to the cloud. There is no possibility that data that sensitive data that you put in the cloud is ever unencrypted because it's encrypted before it gets there. And then the multi-cloud piece, which is fundamental to being a distributed database, means that you don't need to choose which cloud anymore. You can have all of them. You can deploy in up to 80 regions globally. And you can choose the very best of what each cloud has got to offer. So what we had before, dirt, right, was a increase in you know, the kind of complexity that developers had to do with the fragmentation of the developer experience. There were many, many different operational models within that kind of structure where you have lots of different systems. Right? Costs of data integration, data duplication, right, through the roof. Compare that to a unified data development experience. Right? That's what MongoDB is about. It's about this development experience. Repeatable operational security model, right? The idea that all these, pl all these pl platforms, all these, this use case is available to you, and it all uses the same security model. The data is already where you need it. You don't have to move the data to different places in order to access it, all right? It's all in one place. So whichever use case, whichever data model you're choosing to query, the data is right there. And of course, there's a huge saving in terms of data duplication. So just to cover it off, those four guiding principles we talked about, travelers were able to double the productivity of their developers from moving to MongoDB Atlas. Current, who's a, um, a financial uh, a bank, a, a new style bank in, uh, based in New York, they were able to compete in their market very, very quickly, very effectively by bringing new services to online very quickly without a huge operational overhead. My good friends at the Department of Work and Pensions, who I work with very closely, are currently in the process of migrating universal credits to MongoDB Atlas. They could not have done this with our data, citizen data, if they didn't have full confidence in MongoDB's security model. And Humana, who traditionally used Azure services, but wished they could exploit some of the machine learning in GCP. By moving to MongoDB Atlas, that became available to them. In summary, come and see us at the stand, and we'll take you through what MongoDB Atlas looks like. Right? One interface for any application, regardless of where you want to deploy it. Come visit us. It's been wonderful talking to you, and I'm really absolutely thrilled that we get the chance to do this in person again, because it's getting a little tiring doing talks like this over Zoom. But please come and see us. Thank you very much.